What's up, Seattle and Denver? Welcome back for Natural Selection Part 3, covering lessons 1.5 and 1.6. I'm Miss Annie Jarnigan. Just like Ms. Alaski, I teach at Asa Mercer International Middle School in Seattle, Washington. I'm bringing you today's lovely learning from my Fortress of Science. And as a quick introduction, that right there, that's my cat kitty. Not a creative name. Probably won't see her on cam, but you will hear her wrestling around in the background. So what you'll need for this lesson is a pen or pencil, some lined or blank pieces of paper, and optional but encouraged, a family member or friend you can check in with, a copy of the Osterlope and Thorn Palm histograms, a copy of explaining changes in the newt population, and a copy of writing about the rough skin newts. Also awesome if there is a computer logged in to amplify. So let's go ahead and get into our lesson for today. This is Natural Selection 1.5, Adaptive Traits. So go ahead and take a look at the histogram on the left about the rough skin newts 50 generations ago and today, looking at the trait poison level. Now, this would be a great time to pause and talk with your friend, family, or even to yourself. How would you describe the distribution of traits in the population 50 generations ago? How would you describe the population today? And how has the rough skin newt population changed? So go ahead and pause now. So when I look at this histogram for 50 generations ago, what I notice is it started off with a lot and a lot of newts with a roughly low poison amount. But when we look at the population today, it looks like it's almost entirely high poison. And interestingly enough, I'm not seeing any more of these low poison newts. So one way to describe what happened between 50 generations ago to today would be there are more high poison and less low poison newts today than 50 generations ago. So today we're going to be considering a lot about adaptive traits and the impact to environment. But let's first stop for and think for a moment about something called camouflage and how it can help an organism to survive in its environment. So camouflage is an adaptive trait that helps an organism to survive by hiding and blending into its background. A really common example in biology is a pepper moss. Maybe a little hard to see, but we have a pepper moth living right here and another one over here that both have colors and patterns that match to their backgrounds really well. How this is adaptive is that if an organism is able to hide in its environment, it either gains an advantage from hiding away from predators or an advantage in hunting down its own food sources. What we're be considering in the sim today is yellow color is always an adaptive trait in a yellow environment, just like this ostrilope right here living in a yellow environment. So, agree? Disagree? Let's look into some information and find out. To test this idea about adaptive traits, we're going to take the same population of osterlopes and put them into two different situations. The first one's going to be environment A, where we'll have the yellow seven background and we'll have predators called carnathons. Environment B will be the same yellow seven background, but there will be no predators, no carnathons at all. To understand the impact of the environment on a trait, let's start by looking at the starting histogram for these populations. What I can notice here in this histogram is the starting population has actually a pretty large variation of traits ranging all the way from blue colors to greens and yellows, but there's actually no yellow number 10 here, so we're probably not going to see them come up. If you have access to Amplify at home, right now would be a good moment to pause. Go to tab two, investigating adaptive traits in the sim, and try out page two and three for this activity. So I'm in here in the sim and I'm doing environment A. I already set the background color to yellow seven, and I'm gonna leave the little red predators carnathons left on. And I'm also just gonna zoom in for fun and find a yellow seven individual so we can just see what they do. So hit and run, putting on fast forward. All right, well, run around, having babies, eating. His friends are getting eaten, like that blue one and that one. Yeah, well, he's doing right. Oh, nope, there he goes. Okay, well, let's kind of think about what happens after 50 generations. But one thing I can at least tell, he wasn't getting eaten as much as the blue or the green ostrilopes that we saw. 
So if you're working through paper, now's a good time to pause, take out your paper, copy down this histogram, or go to page five in your packet. Okay, now write or discuss. Does the evidence you see here support or refute the idea that yellow seven is always adaptive in a yellow seven environment? Just remember this histogram here is population and environment A in a yellow environment that does have predators. Okay, now that you've had a moment to discuss, let's go ahead and stop for a sec and look at uh, environment B when there are no predators involved. Well, I'm back in here for the sim. I've set it for that yellow seven environment, but I'm gonna remove all of the carnathons and why don't we have fun and just track a yellow seven for a little bit. So I put on fast forward, I'm just kind of watching and honestly, it seems like everybody's fine. I mean, last time I saw carnathons eating all of the blues and the greens and right now it doesn't really seem like it matters. Hmm. So a good moment to pause. This is a histogram I got for environment B when there weren't any predators involved. Go ahead and either copy that down or take a look at it in your packet. And once you have this down, pause a sec and either write or discuss. Does this evidence support or refute the idea that being yellow is always adaptive in a yellow environment? Now that you've had the time to think that over, big question here. What's happening in the populations for both of the environments? And how does this overall support or refute the claim that being yellow is always adaptive to a yellow environment? Go and just talk that out. Let's just spend a quick second analyzing the histogram in the situation when there were predators. What I'm noticing here is that it's really only this yellow seven trait that survived with the carnathons. Every other trait just disappeared, and like I noticed when I was watching the sim, all of the blues and greens and actually some of the yellows still died. Hmm. So what it seems is, since only this yellow seven survived in that environment, seems to me like, yes, this actually seems to support our thinking that being yellow is always adaptive. Now, let's look at environment B at the environment B histogram, what I can notice here is that kind of oddly actually, yellow seven completely disappeared, even though it matched a background. And it seems like actually the blues, the greens, they were doing pretty okay, like we noticed when we ran the sim. So thinking about this, it doesn't seem like being yellow seven in a yellow environment does anything here. I would say this evidence actually very well refutes the idea that being yellow in a yellow environment is always helpful or adaptive. So when we think over the overall why this happens, well, what happens is that if a trait's adaptive or not really depends on the environment. If you're in a situation where something's attempting to eat you, your ability to hide is actually a pretty adaptive trait. You're not getting your face eaten off. You survive to live another day. Have offspring, pass on your traits. But, but, if there isn't something like a predator in your environment trying to hunt you down and eat you, it doesn't really matter if you're camouflaged at that point. And that's what we're seeing here is it didn't matter in the end. So no, actually being yellow would not always be adaptive to a yellow environment. There would have to be something like a predator that would give that advantage. So that brings us to a key concept. Key concept. Over many generations, individuals with adaptive traits become more common in a population, while individuals with non-adaptive traits become less common. Go ahead and pause and write this down. All right, and our kind of second key concept to that, whether or not a trait is adaptive depends on the environment. And it's worth repeating here, environment is all of the abiotic or non-living things and all of the biotic things or the living things in an organism's environment. Okay, for this next activity, we're gonna be making a prediction. A prediction is an idea about what might happen that's based on what you already know. 
we're going to be predicting is water storage traits in thorn palms, a plant. And we're going to think about how high water storage in a thorn palm population can become more common over time. When we look at this in the sim, thorn palms that are thinner like this will be low water storage, the medium water storage, and then the ones with a broad base will be high water storage. So let's think about plants and water storage. What water storage is for a plant is how well a plant can keep water to use later. A good example of a high water storage plant would be a cactus. When it's raining, the cactus stores up water into its body for later use so that when it's not raining, the cactus is still going to be able to survive because they have water that they stored up from earlier. High water storage is actually an adaptive trait seen in many, many plants. Make a prediction now based on what we know about water storage in plants and the information that we can see in the histogram from the starting population. And what we're going to think about is predicting how and why traits for increased levels of water storage can become more common in a thorn palm population. So go ahead, pause now. If you have access to Amplify, go to Lesson 1.5 and click on 3, Modeling Trait Distribution in Thorn Palms. Go to page 2 and try these missions out if you can. I'm going to test these ideas out in the sim, but before we start, I just want to look at the Thorn Palm population to see the variation of traits. I can see a lot of Thorn Palms that seem to have a very low amount of water storage. I'm seeing some that seem like they have a medium amount of water storage. And I'm actually not finding too many that have a thick trunk like this one with a high amount of water storage. I'm going to make a prediction that maybe a medium amount of rainfall will result in a high amount of water storage 50 generations later. So let's try that out. Hmm. It's only been a couple of generations, but things I'm already noticing is there's still quite a bit of the thorn palms that have a lower water storage, but it now looks like there's more with a medium water storage. I'm having trouble finding any that have a high water storage. Oh, there's one. Okay, well here, let's fast forward to 50 generations. So what I'm noticing after 50 generations in the thorn palm population, I'm not seeing any more of the low, low water storage traits when we use medium rainfall. But for medium rainfall environment, I see a lot of medium water storage traits, and I don't see any thorn palms with the traits for wa high water storage. So what does that all mean? Did medium rainfall result in an increase of high water storage traits? Why or why not? Go ahead and press pause now. Looking back into the sim, it seemed like a medium amount of rainfall didn't result into a lot of high water storage traits, so let's try a different situation. I have the same starting population of thorn palms, but now I'm going to set it to where they'll have a low amount of rainfall just like a cactus would. So let's see what happens now. What I'm seeing already happening is quite a few of the medium water storage storm palms are present. I'm not really seeing that many or actually any at all with a low amount of water storage, but I'm noticing a lot of these ones with thick bases of a high water storage. Actually, unlike before, that seems to be all I'm finding now. So again, let's just pause a moment and fast forward in time. This is what I got when I did this for 50 generations with a low amount of rainfall in the environment. With a low amount of rainfall, almost every single trait is gone. There is no more one, two, three, four, all the way up to eight. All of the low and the medium water storage storm palms just disappeared. But what I am noticing is the thorn palms with the high water storage trait they did actually survive, and that became the only trait we saw over time. So, let's consider. Did low rainfall in the environment result in an increase of the high water storage traits? Why or why not? Pause. 
Okay, so we're almost at the end of chapter one with lesson 1.6, explaining changes in trait distribution. So a useful key concept here about cause and effect. Biologists analyze data about population and environment, the causes, to explain changes in the distribution of traits and populations, the effects. And that's actually what we've been doing this whole time. We've been thinking about why would a trait be adaptive or non-adaptive depending on the environment the organism's living in? So let's get a little practice in on describing changes to a population. What we're going to be considering is the thorn palm water storage traits, and we're going to try to describe why the distribution of traits change in this population. So spend a moment looking at the histogram. Okay, let's analyze this together to explain. Originally, these uh, thorn palms lived in a relatively high rainfall environment. And at that time, there was mostly thorn palms that had a low amount of water storage or a medium amount. There was only a few that had a high amount of water storage. But 50 generations later, when the environment changed to low rainfall, all we see is just the trait for level nine water storage, and there's no variation in the population. Well, why did this happen? If we're thinking about a plant's ability to survive without water or without rainfall, they need an ability to store water somehow. What happened is when the environment changed to low rainfall, all of the thorn palms that did not have the ability to store water eventually died because they weren't able to complete life functions. But for those with a level nine water storage trait, this was adaptive to low rainfall. All those with the nine level water storage trait were able to survive, store water, and reproduce offspring. Over time, the level nine water storage trait became the only one in the population because it was most adaptive to its new environment. Okay, now it's your turn. Thinking about the Australope fur distribution traits, based on the information given, how can you explain why the distribution of traits changed in this population? Go ahead and press pause now. Okay, so wrapping up chapter one, we're gonna explain the changes in a new population, and we're gonna look at the chapter one question about what causes new population to become more poisonous. And just as a reminder of the claims, claim one said individuals new became more poisonous because they wanted to, and claim two said the new population became more poisonous because of something in the environment. Now, let's use what we learned over this chapter to see if we can either eliminate or revise some of the claims that we have. So let's start by considering claim one. Claim one said individual newts became more poisonous because they wanted to. Well, let's think this one through. I think being poisonous is pretty cool, and I've been wanting for the last couple of weeks to turn myself into a newt so I can have high poison traits. But no matter how much I seem to want to, I'm not becoming a newt. So this claim doesn't seem to make any sense. The newts couldn't have just wanted to become more poisonous. It had to have been something else. So let's think some more on claim two. Claim two said the newt population became more poisonous because of something in the environment. So let's think back about a few key facts we saw. We saw for certain that, yeah, the newts definitely became more poisonous over time, and there's more high poison newts today than 50 generations ago. And what we also know is our environment changed. There were no snakes in the environment 50 generations ago, but there are snakes in the population's environment today. Let's use what, I know, what we know to revise our claims. So we can take this information and revise our claim to say, the new population became more poisonous because the snakes in the environment caused poison to become an adaptive trait. So what you need to do, use a histogram right over there to explain why the new population became more poisonous because snakes in the environment caused poison to be an adaptive trait. 
And big hint, your histogram has a bunch of great evidence. So go ahead, write, discuss, and pause. I say, so that's a wrap for chapter one. Next time in natural selection, we're going to answer how do individuals in a population get their traits? So from me and the kitty, we're going to sign out now from the Fortress of Science. Take it easy and see you soon.